I think some of our audience may not be familiar with your, your pretty seminal work, Mining for the Streets, uh, in terms of a, sort of a, a manifesto and manual and primer on the idea that everyone can mine and it's it's not hard to get started um, and the benefits of non-KYC sats um, and then your, your work mining for the streets. This whole thing about KYC, non-KYC, w- w- what's happened is KYC has been, the, the, the term itself has been turned into a sort of a catch-all um, to kind of uh, talk about anything that requires any sort of identif- identifiable information. Um, in any capacity, they'll just call it KYC. Um, and it's very important to distinguish between these different levels of privacy, or whether you are being anonymous or pseudonymous, whether something, whether you are going through the actual KYC process, which is a, a, a very specific process um, whereby your information is essentially gathered on a warrantlessly available uh, database that, that can uh, pretty much using a third party doctrine, just be scraped at will. Um, and so it's it's a very tricky thing. Um, but what's very important to understand is that the KYC and, and the setup of the exchanges and the stuff, it, it, it all is about inconveniences and adding little bitty things and perhaps making it a little bit more expensive to go the more private route, which is almost always the case. And those little bit of inconveniences or perhaps a little bit higher price tag um, ends up pushing people towards the more convenient route, which is inevitably centralized KYC exchanges. Um, What I'm fond of saying, and a couple others are as well, is that it's not so much that there is a premium on non-KYC sats. The reality is the non-KYC price, that is the price. That's the street price. When you buy on a centralized KYC exchange, you're actually getting a discount. You're getting a discount for your data. Um, so it uh, that kind of changed that mind frame, which is exactly what I wanted to do with Mining for the Streets. Um, at the time that I wrote that, as I said, I was looking for a way to get into KYC, uh, into non-KYC acquisition of Bitcoin and mining seemed to fit the bill. So I, I go searching around for information. Everywhere I looked, all I could find was discouragement. Everywhere I looked, everyone was saying, don't do it. There's, don't even try it. You can't mine at home anymore. It's not profitable anymore. You can't compete. Just buy Bitcoin. You'll come out better. Um, it, there, it, everywhere I turned, it seemed I couldn't find anyone that was actually encouraging me on any of the, whether it be on Reddit or on Twitter, just anywhere. It was always a discouragement. Sometimes it was outright. Sometimes just, you know, uh, no, no, it's not that, you know, just, just buy Bitcoin, just buy Bitcoin. My whole thinking was, I, I, I got to get something out here to try to change the way that this industry uh, is viewed from one of being solely a, a, a business into one of being an actual acquisition method of Bitcoin. So the way I look at it, the way I termed it is mining at home um, is a way for you to dollar cost average into Bitcoin. You're essentially DCA, but you're doing it through your electric bill. Right? You plug your miner in, you use your electricity, you are dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin, except you're not paying an exchange, you're paying your electric bill, your electric provider. It's the same exact it's the same exact procedure. You're paying off money and you're receiving Bitcoin. There, there is no difference. It's the same thing as signing up on Coinbase or wherever else that you put in a, a dollar cost average order. And if you're able to do this and you're able to do so at a rate that is, say, say maybe you even lose a cent or two, maybe even a dollar a day. Are you willing to pay that extra dollar a day to know that your data is now not available on this KYC database? Is that worth it to you? And if you ask some of the people that are more interested in privacy and, and, and sovereignty and security and things of that nature, I'm quite sure that they would they would agree. If you go on to BISC or Huddle Huddle, you're more than likely you're going to pay a little bit more than the spot price most times. Sometimes you won't, but most of the time you'll be paying a little bit more than what you would on a Coinbase or a Kraken, one of those major exchanges. So it's kind of understood that there is a sort of a privacy premium. Um, so that's okay. We can deal with that. The problem becomes getting people to see this thing as not as a competition um you, you've got to understand that you're not necessarily competing against these huge mining farms all right 
the, those huge mining farms, they can get all the stats that they want to get. But if you plug a miner in, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's an S9 or a brand new S19, whatever it is, however many hashes you can contribute to your mining pool, you're going to get paid for that amount of hashes back. So you're not necessarily competing against these huge mining farms. You are contributing to the network. And by you contributing to the network, you receive Bitcoin uh, as a payment. So it's important because the the incentives all align, which um, as we all know, I mean, incentives are everything. It's why Bitcoin is so beautiful. If everyone acts in their own best interest, that is what's helping the network. It's in your own interest to run a node. It's in your own interest to run your own miner. This is your real money that you've got on the line here. Don't you want to be a part of helping to secure that if you can? I know I do. Um, so all these things are are available it's just a matter of narrative narrative shifting because narratives in bitcoin are very important i know we don't like to talk about it that much and we'd like to dismiss it oh uh, there is no such thing as a bitcoin community uh, the uh, narratives don't matter it's all individuals but in reality in the real world narratives matter immensely it really matters because that it changes the conversations that people have if, we're, if nobody's even talking about mining at home, then it's, it, I mean, there's no discussion of it. It's not even a thought that may enter your mind. So suddenly I put this paper out and I, I had the good fortune of it landing in the lap of a, a couple of people that read it, believed in it, was inspired by it, and went on and actually followed through and did the thing. Econo Alchemist is the prime example of it. I've said a, a bunch of times, I felt like, he kind of like uh, it's almost like a baton like i'm handing it off to him now you go and now since him he's handed it off to several other people that have now put out their own guides on mining and suddenly within a year this entire narrative i've watched it on twitter i've watched this whole narrative change now to where it's not immediately dismissed anymore um now we're down to the nitpicking stuff you know whether it's actually anonymous or private <laughs> all these little things that are but the point is we're past that one big front hurdle of does it even is it even worth talking about we're past that that's the big one to get over now once we're here and we're mining we've got some people getting some sats in in, in their own wallets now we'll figure out the little details and exactly what you need to do and you need to run a vpn whatever you want to do how private do you want it to be but get mining first so it's been a tremendous, this last year uh, or so, however long it's been since I put out Mining for the Streets, it's been amazing to watch people read it and 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 follow um, some recommendations in there and get on their own and then start putting their own guides out. It is an extremely humbling experience to have somebody come on Twitter and announce to the world that they are now more financially sovereign and free because of something that you wrote um, and put out not knowing if anyone would read it. So it's an amazing feeling. It really is.